Farooq Saab, uh, again, looking over the history of cinema and 100 years of cinema, actors and actresses who, will, who are immortal, who have left their, their mark on your mind. But the first person who comes to mind is Madhubala. Anybody who had that kind of looks and who had the range that could satisfy you 100% from Chalti Ka Naam Gadi to Mughal Azam has to be somebody completely extraordinary. You can't, you can't better that. Then, of course, there are so many others. There's Dilip Saab, there is Raj Saab in his better performances. There's Dev Saab for his great elan with which he did. And Nargis Ji. And uh, in today's time and age, the more popular era, we've got Rekha Ji, who's got a fabulous range. And until very recently, I thought she used to do very extraordinary work. And there is, of course, Hema Ji, who has, is in a class of her own. So there is a whole host of people, and we've watched them with great admiration and affection. Mm-hmm. This day and age, do you like the Khans? Do you like what Amir is doing and what Salman and I think and the Shari whole lot of them is far brighter than we were when we stepped oh, in. Why do you say oh, that? 100%. <laughs> I can say that without any undue modesty. Mm. They come so much more better prepared. I think it's a generational advancement also. Each generation is mentally sharper than the previous one. Probably nature is preparing them for what the world is going to be. So they come much more prepared. To give you only one analogy, look at the manner in which little children perform in commercial advertisements these days. Earlier, a full-fledged child artist would be a pain in the neck even in cinema, you know, because Correct. they were so unnatural yeah. and so precocious that you wanted them to either disappear or, God forbid, at least die on the screen. <laughs> But today, they are so completely endearing and so real that even when they are speaking to you as if an adult is speaking to you, you take it to be credible enough. That's right. So that, that evolution has occurred. So today, if you have any number of very talented people, I just wish that they get the kind of scripts and the kind of material that they can dig their teeth into. A few words on Rishikesh Mukherjee, please. Uh, your thoughts on him? What kind of, of a person was Rishida? Rishida, as most of us know, was a very highly qualified science student. And uh, if I remember right, he had topped his his MSc exams and things like that. And then he came into the film industry as an editor with the legendary Mr. Bimal Roy. So that generation which had seen pre-independence and the values that were to be found pre-independence and then immediately post-independence, those values stayed with Rishida till his dying day. You will see so many comedies that Rishida made. There is not a single word, forget a scene, which is something that makes you uncomfortable. And the comedies are brilliant. You can laugh your stomach into, you know, knots. They're so good. How can anybody forget something like Golmal? But look at the kind of people that he used to get to work with him. The writer of Golmal, Ali Raza Saab, was the writer of Golmal and also the writer of Mahabharat, the wow. serial. <laughs> For the Chopras. I mean, so you see the range of the man, mm. that he could do both and he could do both of them so brilliantly. But that's the kind of people they were. And what they were, as I mentioned earlier, used to reflect in their work. You can't have a completely decent, intelligent, educated man doing something that is so crass that you want to turn away the moment you see it on screen. And at, at the other end is also the, the other kind who can't do anything that you would watch with great admiration and, and hope for the future. And Manik Da, the great Satyajit oh, yeah, Ray, was he very yeah. serious on sets? Or? Uh, no, he was he was fun on set. And uh, we used to always have fun at uh, Manik Da's expense at saying that, oh, today at least we'll have a little delay in the pack-up time. <laughs> But that never happened. One day, uh, Sanjeev Kumar Saab and uh, Saeed Jafri and all who were all in the same film, uh, we saw that we reached the same. Everybody would reach on time. Even the legendary uh, Sanjeev Kumar would reach on time. We saw that Manikda was sitting outside the f- shooting floor and getting things painted. And we said, Are ash to maza jayega. <laughs> Today, there will be a delayed pack-up and we'll all pull Manikda's leg. So, we started shooting at 12+. plus. And we said, Reza, today you're going to lose out to us and we are going to win this bet that you won't pack up at 6.30. But the man would do it on the dot. And he'd wow. complete his work. He was, I think, like an artist who was also a mathematician. He would work everything out to the last detail of an equation. And he'd give two plus and then a blank and write equal to four. So you knew that you to, in the blank space, you have to fill in only two. Because he has already written what is after the equal to sign. Mm. But uh, obviously magic. And so complete a filmmaker that he would design your makeup, he'd do his own music, he'd operate his own camera, he'd work out the costumes, he'd everything that uh, a single human being can do in a film unit. And then some, uh, Manikda would do himself. Farooq Saab, the inevitable question, how on earth do you and Shabana Azmi manage to keep Tumhari Amrita so natural? The hundreds and thousands of times that you've done it. I've well, seen it thrice. 20 years this month. 20 years. Yes. But again, mm. Uh, mm. it brings us back to the fundament of any kind of good narrative, which is the script. If you read Tumhari Am- Amrita's script, even even reading it, you know, uh, enthralls you and moves you. That's the, the power of writing. All script writing is really the backbone of any kind of narrative, particularly cinema. 
If you have a weak backbone, then it doesn't matter what else is, you know, decorated well. Or Other than the kind of uh, diction and pronunciation and your uh, amazing natural acting abilities. Uh, please don't undermine that. But I- I'm saying when, when Feroz Khan first came to you and Javed Siddiqui first came to you and said, you know, Farooq Sheikh, this is what we want you to do. Just sit next to her and read letters. Were you convinced or you said it's not going to work? We thought it will flop. <laughs> How honest. <laughs> but uh, um, he said that that's, that's all right mm. because we are going to do it for the late Jennifer Kapoor's. That's right. You yeah. know, mm. memorial. And we'll do about three or four shows, maximum six shows in so called experimental theatre and then pack up. To, very interestingly, the so called dress rehearsal, although there is not much dressing in the play, uh, everybody said, Yaar, ye kaam karo, ban kar do isko, mat karo isko. Because this will be such a big flop, both of you all will get a lot of discredit for this. So we said, Now it's too late because tomorrow we have announced the show and today tonight how can we cancel the show so he said jo hoga hoga kar lo yaar we did and the first show took off like a rocket and then we knew that we have something completely magical in the script and from then to today is 20 years of unstoppable tumhari amrita wow <laughs> speechless uh, last couple of questions why should someone who's just tuned in why should we go into the theaters to see listen to maya day after tomorrow I think everybody should get their money's worth. When you go into a cinema hall, you should demand that I'm spending time, money and energy. I need to get worth all three of these, time, money and energy wise. And and Listen Amaya is definitely one such film. Uh, the last few questions are, are non-film questions. The internet, how much do you use it, Farooq Saab? And how, much, how has it revolutionized your life? Are oh, you on social does. networking? Do you Google a lot? When I start how to switch on the computer, then I'll come back for another another interview and then I'll have evolved further. And so evolution will have to come before evolution. <laughs> at the moment, I can't even switch on the computer. My daughters and my wife who are like very adept at it think that I'm going back to the you know Paleolithic age where these <laughs> things did not exist. So you're still a, a fountain pen or a ball pen man? What I'm a ball on? pen person and I'm a SMS person. And that's as far as I've got. <laughs> um, what do you want to improve about Mumbai City? It need not just be infrastructure, it can be mindset, anything. Well, if we all start treating it as a home, things will start improving automatically. Unfortunately, and I've lived all my life in Mumbai, what was then Bombay and which is now Mumbai. We treat it like a visit to the market. We will go, we will work, we will go shopping, we will go home. So, market is bad or good, it doesn't make a difference to us. But if you treat it as your home, where you are going to live, then you take care of it. And by that, I certainly do not mean, and I absolutely do not uh, you know, speak on behalf of people who make loud noises about Amchi Mumbai and actually do very little about Mumbai. But you have to treat it like your home. It is giving you everything that you are getting. And it has been a very welcoming city. Nothing symbolizes India in terms of its welcome aspect as much as Mumbai does. You'll have all kinds of people coming in here, making a living and a home here. And then being so welcome and doing so well that they don't want to go back, which is fine. But then give back to the city what it is, at least the part of what it has given to you. That really is what I would wish for Mumbai. Your favorite international travel destination and your favorite local travel or holiday destination? Wherever I go with my family becomes my favorite destination. In India, I'm happiest when I'm in my village where I have a small farm and things like that and where I was born. Where is that? Uh, that is 50 miles from Baroda, which is where I was born. And I still have a home and rel- very close relatives and family and things like that. And all kinds of animals and things. So I feel very one with creatures that function at my level. <laughs> and outside India, wherever I go with my family. When was the last nice uh, memory? Last year we went to Istanbul mm-hmm. and spent quite a bit of time. Fabulous city. Absolutely food to die for and all kinds of food. And uh, because it has been you know, at the hub of Western and Eastern culture, it's a delight of a place, even if you want to just look around the city. Sadly, it's disappearing. The old city is disappearing very fast because it's become such a popular tourist destination. So whoever wants to go to Istanbul, better do it immediately because they'll see the old and the new. Yeah. So are you a Mughlai food person or any food person? <laughs> I'm any food person that tastes good. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to ask Deepti Nawal this uh, eventually uh, when she comes in. She's a grass eater. <laughs> but I'm going to ask you, how or what is Deepti Naval. How do you describe Deepti? She's one of her finest actresses. And partly her own doing, partly the misfortune of the industry. She hasn't got what she deserved. She's got a lot, but she deserved much more. Because she's one of our very rare performers. And uh, the kind of range that Deepti ji possesses is something that most actresses should die for. Because she can, you know, uh, make you a cup of tea on screen and make it look absolutely natural. And she can murder you on screen uh, and make it look absolutely natural and necessary. She often murders me behind the (laughs) camera, but that doesn't look so natural to me. 
Farooq Sahab, your warmth, your wit, and uh, just your your presence has been so amazing. Thank you so much for coming to ninety four point three Radio One and sharing these wonderful moments. With Great us. pleasure. I'll hope to speak to you after you have seen Lisa Namaya. Of course. Thank you.